This is Fiona Givens. My husband Terrell and I recently sat down in studio with our friend Spencer Fluman, Executive Director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute at BYU, to talk about ideas and themes from our new book, The Christ Who Heals. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Over the coming months, Terrell Givens will be sitting down with some of the most fascinating and influential people in Mormonism. To watch or listen in on those conversations, please be sure to subscribe to the Conversations with Terrell Givens podcast on iTunes or wherever you access podcasts. You can also visit faithmatters.org and subscribe to this and other fascinating podcasts there. You're making me think, too, of uh, a little bit of the title. And I wanted to pause on the title of the book and to have you both talk through why is it the Christ who heals? Why, why does that come forward yeah. for you as you're, as you're working through what the restoration actually restores right. in terms of Christ? I was reading Marilyn Robinson's Gilead, which I think is one of the greatest novels of our lifetimes. And there's a line in there where a preacher notes the fact that Sozo, the Greek word for saving, can also mean to heal. And that was the trigger that, that got me thinking along these lines. And so mm. I went to the Greek text, and I looked at how this word is being used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it turns out that every time there's a healing, the woman with the issue of blood, the girl that dies, the, 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 the man born blind, it's always sozo. Sozo, they're, they're sozoed. <laughs> and that's translated as healed. But if you look at every time the word save appears in the New Testament, it's from the same, the same word, sozo. In other words, you could, with just as much linguistic accuracy, translate the term Jesus Christ, healer of the world. Mm. And in fact, that's how the word operates in German, das Heiland, which means the healing place or the healing one. And it seems to us that there's a, a huge difference between conceiving of Christ's work as that of saving us from our sinful selves and healing us of the harm that we do to ourselves and to each other through poor choices. And um, I was reading the 1830 edition of the, the Book of Mormon at about the same time and came across what today is 1 Nephi 13, at which point Nephi is talking about the plain and precious parts that have been taken from the Bible. And it's verse 32, as I recall. I think it's verse 32. It? And, and there's this magnificent promise, which I think is a condensation of the whole restoration in this one line, hmm. that God will not forever suffer them to remain in their state of woundedness because of the plain and precious parts that have been taken from the Bible. And that gets changed. And that gets changed. <laughs> 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 changed. A, a lot of Latter-day Saints, you know, readers are going to be like, I no don't idea. remember that verse. That gets changed yeah. to blindness. And then a Book of Mormon scholar thinks that that actually should be wickedness. And I'm saying, no, 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 you're missing the point. You're going back to the Protestant school of thought. It is, a, it is a verse of promise and mercy. The Lord is saying, look, it's not your fault those plain and precious things were gone. What plain and precious things? We think the plainest and precious things were the true nature of God the Father is a suffering, vulnerable, weeping God. You take those things out and we live in a life of fear and perpetual woundedness. And the Lord is promising that through some mechanism, which we think is the restoration, yeah. I will bring healing to that woundedness, which is another sign to us. And this is what Christer Stendhal said. Christer Stendhal may not be a name familiar to everybody, but he was the dean of Harvard Divinity School. He was a Lutheran bishop. He was one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. And he said, Paul's preoccupation was not with his sinful self. It was with his weakness. Very different. Very different from the Protestant of the, of the, narrative. Of the problem for the human condition, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And now there's this this enormous movement of tremendous importance called the New Perspective on Paul movement, which is coming to realize, you know, maybe we've been reading Paul wrong ever since St. Augustine. And maybe, in fact, Paul wasn't obsessed with this human depravity, but he sees the, greatest, the greater problem as just our incapacity. And Christ comes not to remedy this depraved, horrific condition, yeah. but to heal and nurture us and restore us to unity with ourselves with each other and with our Father. And I, I, I know some people are going to say, but I, I see a lot of that rhetoric in the Restoration Scriptures. Sure, sin, Absolutely. salvation from sin, it, it, mm -hmm. it's a prominent thing. Exactly. And then we have um, 
is it section 7646 where we have that idea of Christ you know I I will take their sins upon me I am the advocate uh, with the section father 45. is it section 45 mm -hmm. what verse is it the first three verses okay yeah so this I thank you darling so this idea you do see this idea of Christ um, behaving as a shield but when one um, understands that um, Christ is is, is not behaving like that. He is behaving as a healer, that I've come to heal them. Then one, get, one has a much better understanding. For me, the, um, the Restoration Scriptures are transitional texts in that they had to be written in 19th century religious rhetoric. Otherwise, nobody would have understood the language. Yeah, it would be, be completely yeah. foreign. They'd be speaking a completely different language. So, of course, we're going to see um, remnants this, this in that. This is where Brigham Young said if the Book of Mormon were translated today, it would be stealing? translated I'm in a different language. Not, oh, you were going to oh, say that? Yes, <laughs> I was going to say that. There is this wonderful quote from Brigham Young. He yeah. says that if the Book of Mormon were written in any other century, it would be considerably different. It was written in the 19th century, in 19th century Protestant America. So we're going to find a lot of that language in there. But, but this is what is so crucial. We also find those transitional texts. I'm not sure why Joseph took out woundedness. It it may have been, you know, his advisors were saying, you know, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. What does it mean? That's a 21st century word. We or, all or understand. Or a knee-jerk reaction to what, it yeah, seems odd it given his own cultural setting. Exactly. We don't know. There, there's a moment like that in Helaman where he feels awkward about the grammar. And so in 1837, he changes the grammar. We now know that the 1830 language was a perfect replication of Hebraic construction. So yeah. he was insecure enough about his own grammar, his own language, and sometimes his edits were not yeah. always but the that, best. But yeah. that being said, um, we do have Moses 7. We do have Jacob 5. And those are the longest treatises of um, a vulnerable, weeping God that exist in all of of, of religious, well, Christian religious canon. So, so those are incredibly important. And then the idea that Ter Terrell was talking about healing, I, I think it's really important when we see repeated um, this, the, the combination of good and evil. So, for example, after um, Adam and Eve partake of the fruit, um, nobody ever reads as far as Genesis 3. They all think it's a done deal. But Genesis 3, verse 22, God says they have become as one of us knowing good and evil. So if we use that in the Hebraic sense, it's experiencing good and evil. Now, this is the exact passage which the West, Western Christianity took and ran with and said, obvious, this was hubris, that they, they dared to become yeah, like this God. This was the great sin. This was yeah. the great sin. So we are born into a wounded world. Going back to 1 Nephi 13, 32, it's not sinful, it's wounded. And probably the most... Um, efficacious analogy, at least for me, is schizophrenia. So a child is born. There is no evidence of schizophrenia. Um, he grows up. The schizophrenia grows up with him. There is still no evidence that the child um, is thus encumbered until he turns 19 or 20, and then he starts hearing the, the voices in his head. So I think if we look at, at this, at that we, we, are, we are born into a wounded world of wounded parents that we're all carrying DNA and genetic dispositions that tend to, for example, depression, um, addiction, and one thing or another, then I think we get a much greater understanding of what this is all about. This is more about suffering and how suffering sanctifies. And so we have Christ, this beautiful scripture of Christ, I come with healing in my wings. Not only have I come to bring life, but I have come to bring life more abundantly, and I have come not to condemn. So if he's not coming to condemn, then sin cannot be the, 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 the major perspective of, of the theology. It cannot be what we are here for, but we all understand suffering. So you've also raised the topic of judgment. Yes. And so that's another word that we think needs yeah. scrutiny. And uh, judgment is from the Greek word krino, and a, a fuller, richer definition would be discernment, differentiation, distinction. And that's what we see God himself manifesting in the first days of creation. He separates. Everything is separated. Earth from water, earth from sky, man from woman. 
and then he judges it good. Mm. He recognizes these differentiations, these distinctions are what constitute divine activity. And, you know, President Uchtdorf gave a talk recently in conference when he used judgment in a very unconventional way, when he said the day of judgment will be a day of mercy and healing. Now, we don't typically think of judgment as a day of, 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 of it's, healing. It's striking. That's right. It is. That's right. But I think the key is in Paul, uh, his epistle to the Corinthians, when he tells us that, that Jesus will judge us so that he need not condemn us. Judgment, as I understand, as we understand it's being used in both the Book of Mormon and in the New Testament, is that process by which we are brought to recognize distinctions and how they have operated in our lives and in our character. When it, judgment in this sense is a prelude to further progress. So judgment is that process by which we are made to become aware of where we are, what yet needs to be done, what lies have we been telling ourselves? How have we been alienated from our true identities? Kind of self-realization in it's a way. Self-realization. Self, and yeah. this, yeah, and the Book of Mormon has this wonderful language about, about coming to a perfect knowledge of themselves, right? And they yeah. shall have a perfect knowledge of their happiness and, and is, is, is one phrase that is used. And so we think that, that judgment is a much less threatening. And uh, Christ is very emphatic, right? I don't come to judge the world. I don't come to condemn the world. Even the woman caught in adultery I judge in the sense of, go thy way and sin no more. This is a distinction that needs to be made, but it's not tied to condemnation. This isn't to say we don't sin. And We're then, capable of doing really bad things. I was just things. going to say it. I was yeah. just going to say, you're yeah. not denying the reality yeah. of evil. You're not denying the reality of sin, acting knowingly yeah. against God's will for your life. Uh, it's, it's not to deny, and it's not to deny Christ as judge either. But what it does is it reframes, right. reformats all of those words in that cosmic context of healing, of education, where the atonement is not simply a way to, to undo your sins and get you back to a kind of starting point. I mean, that's one way that, that Latter-day Saints could, could think right. wrong in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. But mm -hmm. instead, it's, a, it's, a, it's transformative, yes. it's educative, it's progressive and, and and you end the book with a kind of striking crescendo where that um, educative progressive um, developmental sense of Christ's mission for humanity doesn't end that it's um, it's kind of striking um, talk us through that judgment yeah um, is is reframed in a particular way uh, and can be for the latter day saints. Yeah, Joseph F. Smith, as prophet, gave this magnificent um, uh, expression when he said that Christ's work wasn't finished when he died on the cross, and it isn't finished today. He continues his work, and it will continue to go on until the entire human family is, is fully redeemed. Joseph Smith uh, taught very clearly and explicitly that progress is eternal. And uh, there's a marvelous moment that occurs. And if we start with section 76, when he has a vision of the terrestrial world, and he sees the terrestrial world is inhabited by those who receive not the witness of Christ in the flesh. Um, those who were not baptized, didn't go through the ordinances of, of salvation. He had lost his brother Alvin in 1823. Never, never fully recovered from that loss. And he knows now there's some comfort Alvin is going, will be in the terrestrial kingdom. Yeah. And then six years later, in 1838, he has the vision of the celestial kingdom. It's a very different picture of Alvin. Very different yes. picture. And he's yeah. shocked. And he tells us in the first verse of the scripture, I was amazed. There's my brother Alvin, and he's in the celestial kingdom. How could he be here? How could he be here? And that's where we believe he, he first came to understand that no progress is eternal. And contemporaries of Joseph Smith recorded him giving public sermons in which he was very explicit about this, that, that progress is eternal. This is why I think it was B.H. Roberts who first used the term eternal progress, eternal progressivism. And um, Hiram Smith taught the same thing, Brigham Young, Lorenzo Snow, Joseph F. Smith. They all taught that God never shuts the door on our salvation. Elder Hales, recently deceased, gave a beautiful talk five or six years ago in which he pled with the parents of the church. He said, please, never, never, never shut the door of your hearts to your children. And Elder Packer um, said that there is no sin, no sin that we can commit that is not beyond the bounds of complete and full forgiveness. So we, we are convinced that Joseph, the historical record makes clear, this isn't speculation, the historical record makes clear that Joseph believed in a God who never shut the door 
on his children. And it would seem that history bears record of every prophet up through the 1950s teaching that same principle. In the 1950s and 60s, there were dissident voices on that subject heard in the church. And when the first presidency was appealed to uh, on two different occasions by members of the church to arbitrate the dispute, the secretary to the first presidency responded by saying, this is not a point of settled doctrine. Mm. So there is no yeah. official position uh, as to what is the meaning of final judgment. All we are saying is that the historical record suggests that Joseph's understanding, and as I said, that of every other prophet up through the 1950s, was that progress is eternal. Only if we have a complete and unqualified knowledge of all things, and in the face of that brilliance of the sun at noonday, reject Christ's offer, do we, do we qualify to be a son of perdition? Most of us are making decisions under incredible duress, yeah. Um, um, I, I, and 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 simply cannot see. Will. Yes, it is to a certain extent, and so then I think it leads much greater emphasis um, to this idea of healing and of mercy. And um, I was asked once by a BYU student. We'd been discussing um, Julian of Norwich, who um, uh, who, who is um, one of my greatest heroines are talking about God's absolute love, how absolute love. In fact, it's so absolute, she says, it does not matter whether we be foul or clean. God loves us with absolute love equally. And this young man stood up and he, uh, he put up his hand. He said, well, what about judgment? And I paused and I asked him, I said, how do you feel when you hear the word judgment? He says, I feel fear. I am afraid. And I responded by saying, if you feel fear, that is not God speaking. And this is what is so beautiful about our theology is that we worship a God who chose to love us absolutely and made himself vulnerable. And it is through this vulnerability that he has the power to draw all mankind to him. And, and that I find is so beautiful. Um, we so, uh, ra radically resonant. We sometimes use the analogy of the school teacher, and we think that Latter-day Saints have too often been misled into thinking there are only two options, right? We believe in the in the sweet school marm. Who lets anything go. Who lets anything go. Yeah. I'm going to pass you all, yeah. right? We'll give everybody a pass. A that's few the, stripes. That's so right. Few stripes with a, a, a few cane, stripes. and then so the, you still go in. The false the universalism of the Book of Mormon. Or you've got the strict disciplinarian school teacher who know you studied, you take the exam, and if you fail, you fail, and you're out. And we believe there's a third way, and that is, that is the God who is the ever-patient tutor, who commits to us and says, I will never forsake you, and I will do whatever it takes until you master this material and are transformed by it. And that's the God that we believe Joseph Smith restored. Mm. And, and so I think this sort of um, emphasizes our point that given all of these um, handicaps, so to speak, with which we are all working then judgment cannot be final. Um, it, uh, if, if we consider our spirits to be eternal, um, to be coexistent with God, and for us to become like God, then there have to be many, many stages. This is one of them. This is a particularly brutal stage, which is why God promised, I, I will, I'll make sure it's short, um, because it's, it's particularly painful. But it's also a crucible and and um, most of, uh, and our daughter Rachel uh, quoted this this idea of this um, crucible being able to refine what is, what are her exact what is her exact quote well, alchemized that's that yes. our suffering can be alchemized yes, that, into something yep, sanctified that the Godhead has the power to alchemize our suffering into something beautiful. Mm. So it is only by our patience being challenged, our love being challenged, our mercy being challenged in very real and personal and painful ways that we can actually learn what it means to be patient, loving, and merciful. And that's going to take a long time, far beyond, yeah. far beyond yeah, James this James Talmadge in the House of the Lord, he said, if, uh, if we believe in eternal progression, then we have to believe in eternal repentance. Because that means to continually revise our our conduct, our attitude. So it's heart. not repentance in the negative way. It's education. 
you know, got that yeah. sum wrong, so let's try a different equation. And, um, and it's never under threat and it's never under coercion. I think that hangs over us, um, definitely as Protestants, but unfortunately, even as Mormons, this idea that uh, there, there's this almost coercive element that if you don't do exactly what I say, and again, the elder or President Uchtdorf was so brilliant. He said, "Obedience for obedience' sake is not." Well, this is this is, is why we is not is not. We love Kenneth Kirk, thing. who's our, my favorite Anglican theologian, and he said three things are true of God's love. Mm. He said, first, God's love frees the giver because you give without expectation of return. It frees the recipient because you're under no contractual obligation. But he said, most importantly, the third thing that is true of love is that in the end, it's irresistible. Nothing can withstand the force and power of an overwhelming love. And that's why we think it's very, very deliberate and inspired that the Book of Mormon uses the word draw so often. Mm -hmm. We are drawn to Christ. We are drawn. And, and that in yeah. section 121, you know, the power of the priesthood, which is... Not coercive. Yes. It's not about dominion. It's not about dominion. It's the, not coercive. The, 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 exactly. The power rests in... I, yeah. Christ's power has everything to do with me wanting to follow. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And if Christ's power is that way, then so is God the Father's. And um, so is God the Mother. It is not a coercive power. It's a drawing eventually of all their children back home to them. And... Um, I, I don't think any other religious text has that quite so unambiguously as ours does, particularly section 121. In fact, you know, amen to the priesthood of that person, yes. you know, is, 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 who, who attempts, even attempts to coerce is um, one of my children. So, um, so anyways, so that's what we found so absolutely yeah. beautiful is finding these resonances because we feel you, uh, it, it's been difficult. So what, what exactly is it that Joseph is restoring? Because when we go back in the Western tradition, none of it's very happy. I mean, we, you know, we start off with this veering aside with Augustine. There's no free will and, um, and, and there's only imputed grace. There is nothing you can do of yourselves, good or bad. And then it's like Luther, Calvin and Swingley are Augustine on crack. You know, it's it's like God plans everything, the good and the evil. So suddenly we've turned God into a monster. And I and I think with all of these competing um ideas um in our minds, it, it it for for me especially, it was so beautiful to discover um the early Greek church fathers, the early church fathers, they are they are post-apostolic immediately. And 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 the and the Christian Church was birthed in the East, not in the West. We tend to think it's in the West, but in the East, and find those radical resonances with Mormonism, and it gave me a greater understanding. Okay, this is what Joseph is restoring. It is magnificent. Mm -hmm. It is empowering. It is all embracing. It is the most beautiful thing um, that has ever been. So if I can if I can just circle back yeah. by way of conclusion to the first question, what what generated this book? What, yeah. what did we hope to achieve with it? We live in the midst of a of a of a, of a great uh, series of uh, forces and influences hostile to faith. We are in the midst of many thousands of people struggling with their testimony and their spiritual journeys, and we believe that. Mormonism is so rich, it's so interesting, it's got so much stuff going on, gold plates and angels and Mesoamerica and books of Abraham, and, and we get distracted from the foundation. And it's our belief that to come to know the true Christ of the Restoration is to have the only testimony that is absolutely impregnable to the assaults of, of secularism and, and the modern world. And so we were trying to rediscover for ourselves uh, the Christ of the Restoration. Tara, Fiona, we've talked about some rich theological perspectives. You've given us a, a kind of history lesson from a very, you know, complex past for the Christian tradition. You've, you've shown us how the Restoration does just that, restores some things that are beautiful. Um, Showing us all sorts of, of ways that, that this can enrich our approach to the scriptures, our own approach to the atonement. I'm wondering if you could each think and, and, and briefly give us a thought on, in practical terms, 
Latter-day Saint picks up the book, reads it. What do you hope they, they take away practically from these ideas about Christ as healer, et cetera? What do you, practically, what do you hope they take away from it? As a parent, I think that all those in the church who have experienced parenthood know that there's no way on earth that a repentant 25-year-old son would come begging at their home's door to be greeted with the words, I'm sorry you had your chance, and the door shuts. And I think that what we have tried to rediscover is the reality of a Christ who could no more do that to his children than we could to ours. And that the Christ of the Restoration resonates with those experiences that we actually live through as parents and children and attest to the reality of the nature that we have tried to recuperate through Joseph Smith's teachings. Hmm. Yeah. Joseph once said that he was um, empowered to be better, to do better, when people treated him with kindness and gentleness rather than when he was rebuked or admonished sev um, severely. And I, I feel the same way in my life that, um, and when I think of us um, all struggling under the crosses which we all bear, to be greeted with absolute love, you know, said, I know you're struggling, um, I am here. It was, I was in Italy last week and um, this beautiful institute instructor, Ugo Perego, um, talked about comforter and he said in Latin, it's come split come forte, with strength. And so I find that, uh, that, was, that was, for me, that was so lovely. It's like, I come with healing, and that healing is strengthening. It will strengthen you to take that next step forward mm. and that next step forward. And not only will it do that, but it will empower you to be able to see in times of your life, sometimes our pain is so so deep that we, we cannot see anything around us. But when those times come when it is not so that we turn and we reach out to each other as we're struggling beneath our crosses under that absolute love and that constant, well done, my good and faithful servant. Keep trying, keep trying, keep coming, keep coming. Those resonate really beautifully for me, those words. Beautiful. Thanks to you both. Thank, Thank you. you, Spencer. Thank you, Spencer.